often mention heads or tails. And all the way in the 80s, long before I had been favored to attend the seminary and to come here and as an adult, June 14th, 1987, young adult, uh, deliberately present myself to be elected into the body of Christ and membership here. You all almost did a background check, those of you that aren't involved in those things. I still have the certificates of baptism. My brothers and I were all baptized the same day, March 24th, 1974. I have those. I know when we first started doing certificates here, we had a few people that, you know, they hadn't heard of that. I'm like, well, apparently it doesn't exist then. Amen? Don't you love it when people talk as if whatever is between their ears must be the world? But growing up, you, you learn a lot of things because a book by Dr. Sidlow Baxter, explore the book, old hard copy stuff. And we had a proof of inspiration in it showing that the decree to build the wall of Jerusalem, to rebuild that, March 14th, 445 B.C., that if you took that date until the day Christ arrived in His triumphant entry on A.D. 32, April 6th, it was exactly 173,880 days, which is exactly 483 years times 360 day year. And you're like, whoa, prove to the day. And when I was just, oh, so thankful and so my eureka moment, proof of inspiration. And that's when heads or tails started. Well, wait a minute, which Bible? Uh, what do you mean, which Bible? Do you know I didn't know that the Bible I was proving to be inspiration, not inspired, that was a process of originally producing the original, as we call them, autographs. They're really divine graphs, they weren't auto, that's self. But it never occurred to me that there were people already prepared to heads or tails me. And I said, I don't know what, what all these years of working to prove inspiration you're saying now, I don't even know of which Bible I'm speaking. Well, was it Oxford or Cambridge? Go ahead, I'm waiting. See, what happened to me was all for your favor in the future because what I'm able to endure and go through, the Lord was preparing me to be able to relieve people when they get placed on the uh, horns of a two-pronged dilemma. Do you like being in a dilemma where people do that? Into now, they seem to be happy to put you on the horns of a two-pronged dilemma, maybe a three-pronged dilemma. But they don't, you just don't see a lot of people coming by <laughs> to relieve people of that. So I'm very thankful that I did find people. Actually, as I met some guests this morning and were speaking to them, they asked, are you a Southern Baptist or Independent Baptist? I said, no. <laughs> Southern Baptist Convention and Independent Baptist. I said, we're Associational Baptist. Said, Brother Carter, why do you notice the middle and everything? I was taught by you all. Are you Protestant or are you Catholic? No. Are you Judaic or Islamic? No. Are you occultic or New Age? No. Are you denominational one? Denom no. We are the called out body of Christ Jesus, truly His body under His headship. He's the head of the body. Wait a minute, what did you say? I, I, I gave you your options. Now you're not picking options. No, no. And I was so happy when I was sent here and favored to be called out from all that. And I love helping people. I, do you know that some of the things that I mentioned have never bothered me in my entire life? But do you know there's dear, precious people out there that almost... Uh, it's, it's because they've been primed in the affective side of their emotions so much and been so hyper-primed and it's been amplified so much that if you even appear to be someone who might be challenging what they feel is the truth, just the idea that they might think about it is too much for them. And there are people out there that just love to push them around. Remember I told you about those intellectual bullies, but really the only problem with that phrase is the word intellectual. They just intimidate people, which is to install timidity. And these dear people are there. And Paul told Timothy that God did not give us a spirit of timidity. He did not give you one of fear, a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. You see that? So when I mention helping people, it's, 
is because none of us really know what happens when something happens to us. I was helping a dear soul in a crisis and they were just saying, I've done this wrong, I did that wrong, I didn't do that, I should have done I said, oh no, no one has to necessarily or does necessarily know what the right thing to do when something wrong happens. Do you know people have actually exited the wrong door in a calamity in a building and died? That's why there's a light back here that says exit. That's why things have to be open and aisles cleared. Because during a moment, someone might not make the right choice because they're not thinking, they're just feeling. Do you know people trampled each other recently in a calamity? So I always try to tell people, you need to be careful when you're in a large crowd. Why? Well, not the fire that you heard, but the herd that you might be trampled by. Dr. Michael Horton wrote an article, Preaching Christ Alone. He said, if our preaching does not center on Christ from Genesis to Revelation, no matter how good or helpful, it is not a proclamation of God's Word. That's quite a bold statement. You know, since there's so much preaching that's nothing more than a forensic, some logistic, some construct that they've added one more part to that might under these circumstances. Jesus said, you search the Scriptures in vain, thinking that you have eternal life in them, not realizing that it is they which testify concerning me. With these words, our Lord confronted what has always been the temptation in our reading of Holy Scripture, to read it without Christ as a supreme focus of revelation. You know, some people uh, really think it's amazing how they can find in the Bible a proof text for what they believe. Did you know that? They don't even know that there's enough words there you could find any proof for anything you want to have move around between your ears. Amen? First perverse exposition, those you all should get shirts. We survived Brother Carter's verse by verse by verse exposition. We were going through Matthew, if you recall. Some of you were here at North First. And a dear person came. I would just say a pigeon was sent with a message attached to his little foot. He landed and he said, you know, there's several people concerned about how long we've been in Matthew. And I said, that's not possible. He said, oh, no, I'm serious. They really are concerned. I said, well, I mean, it's not possible because I haven't preached the same verse twice. <laughs> Did y'all get that? So if you're in Matthew chapter 1 and you're in verse 4, next week we'll be in verse 5. Get it? So that was trained verse by verse. Do that. Be a good soldier. Stand up there. <laughs> y'all remember all that. But it says, having been raised in churches which painstakingly exegeted a particular passage verse by verse, this man said he's profited from the insights this method sometimes offers. Nevertheless, it too falls short of an adequate way of preaching, reading, or interpreting the sacred text. What are you supposed to do? I mean, you give up your life to train, to be a subject matter expert with specialized knowledge. You go painstakingly verse by verse by verse and the people who sent you to the seminary then say you're in the same book too long. But that's not a pickle for me. What do we do? We finish Matthew. Amen. So when people say, why don't you go verse by verse? I said, I've already done that. Well, I mean, like every book of the Bible, I've already done it. And I'm like, like uh, more than once, several of them. There's a man named John Calvin. Some of you have heard of him. Mixed feelings about him. He, he didn't much care for Baptists, but that's not his fault. That's just what history says. But he says this. He said, First we bid a man to begin by examining himself, and this not in a superficial and perfunctory manner. You remember uh, Dr. Muncie Harris came here for Fishers of Men, and we had a special outreach Sunday, and he stood and he said, Search me, O God, and he was reading from the Psalms. And he was imploring us to know that before we go out to engage a community, with Christ, we should first call upon this Lord to search us out. Very convicting message. It says here, But to cite his conscience before the tribunal of God, and when sufficiently convinced of his iniquity, to reflect on the strictness of the sentence pronounced on all sinners, thus confounded and amazed at his misery, he is prostrated and humbled before God, and casting away all self-confidence, groans as if given up to final perdition, then we show that the only haven of safety is in the mercy of God as manifested in Christ in whom every part of our salvation is complete. As all mankind are in the sight of God lost sinners, 
We hold that Christ is their only righteousness since by His obedience He has wiped off our transgressions by His sacrifice, appeased the divine anger. Well, that was quite a remarkable statement, wasn't it? That's why some of you are like, we're recording no matter what someone says that, that you've heard people say, that you say that someone said that they said something about you, you just almost laugh. Uh, then have you ever seen yourself in the presence of the holy, righteous God? who so loved that He gave His only begotten Son, who was the sinless sacrifice. And to know that He lived the life for me that I did not want nor could I live for myself. And He gave me that life to count when I stand before His Father as my life, as my righteousness. And He showed me my filthy rags. So in light of Jesus, and knowing that there is no comparison, rather contrast, and in a very, in a very fallible contrast indeed, and you have to literally be subject to the searching of the heart by God. And come to the knowledge of my own wretchedness, as I said, they now, have now for some time taken the word wretch out of the word amazing grace, and what would a wretch do but do that? Amen? Get it? It's what a wretch would do. Think more highly of himself than he should. People go around like, oh, somebody said that about me? Oh, shuck, you poo. I'm like, mm, it ain't half what my wife knows. Dear man was here once. We'd come back from a revival and they had done testimonies. And on our way home, he was saying, my, I appreciate those testimonies. That man stood up and said God had delivered him from alcohol. I said, amen. I love to hear it. Another one had a terrible habit. It's not even worthy of repeating it. But she was so thankful God had delivered her from it. He said, we should have said something. I said, oh, I couldn't have spoken. I said, they'd all cleared the building and raced out the door screaming. He said, why did you say that? I said, well, I can tell you about demons from hell. I can tell you about things that destroy people's lives. I can tell you about forces that converged in my life that apart from the grace of God, that in broke like a light in a dark place that made it look as if there was nothing to it. I said, I'd have stood up and started talking and wouldn't have stopped talking about all that God's delivered me from by His grace. And what do you think about that? I'm glad you just sat there. Now don't get me wrong, I don't minimize someone's victory over something because you know if it's your battle, it's serious, isn't it? It's serious, isn't it? It's like when you're at the hospital and someone says, oh, they're having minor surgery. There's no such thing, is there? A dear friend of mine, his young son went in just to have a minor procedure on his arm. He never survived until the, for the procedure. Whatever the reaction was to whatever they did, So he said, wait a minute, don't talk like that. Oh no, it's good to talk like that. It's good to know things before we get involved. It's good to understand the reality of our life brevity. It's good to understand that we were so blessed at North First that all people could say was, I think we're in one book too long. Amen, praise God, amen. I was sharing this morning a blessing I'd had in my life. It was such a joy, I can't even tell you. A dear man, an older gentleman, was in an attic at one of these church houses that had that attic type. He'd spent hours, almost heat exhausted, almost died. And of course, me being the good Christian, young man, I stood down and said, you okay up there? Get it? I'm down here. It's not hot. He installed emergency light like the one off in the corner over there. Did you know at the upcoming business meeting, I know you all don't know what I'm talking about, but they had business meetings where it looked like no holds barred. <laughs> there were two sisters here, beautiful, not sisters, but in Christ, but these two beautiful ladies, one named Jan, one named Dot. They told me when I was just a boy associate pastor here, a younger man, much younger than even Scott now, they said, we don't even go to the meetings. They're so bad, we don't want to be part of it. And I thought, that's real to them. They did not have the fortitude to bear the silly antics in a meeting so they'd rather be able to go about their lives, socially speaking, without having to worry about running into someone or a side they would have to pick. Can you imagine? Does anybody ever remember Jan and Dot? Well, that business meeting came up, and do you know what happened? Somebody didn't like where that emergency light was. But we had this wise young pastor. I think he was 26, named Tim Carter, and he was standing there. He said, I tell you what, whoever is willing to go up in the attic for the next six hours sometime next week and relocate it, so mote it be. <laughs> he said, Brooke, why are you laughing? Well, because later a gentleman came up and he's so sorry about that meeting. He said, I'm sorry you had to see. I said, oh no, I'm thankful. I said, my, y'all must be prosperous here and blessed beyond if all you got to worry about is where a light is located by someone else's efforts. Amen? He said, Brooke, you're looking at it all wrong. Oh, no, no, no. 
This church doesn't say that anymore. This church says exactly right. Spot on, pastor. Spot on, preacher. Boy, you're calling it the way it is. Matter of fact, if we go through a book next time, won't you be blessed that God kept you alive long enough to see it to its end? C.S. Lewis said it's called the Christ and Syndrome. Because after all, we gather as the ecclesia, but also as a business man. Because I asked them in a meeting, I said, now, when we call the meeting order, do we stop being a church? Because I don't see some things happening here that you would ever do in the church house. Matter of fact, I knew a man once and he couldn't tell a joke unless we got 20 yards from the church house. Y'all listen, this is funny. It's my wife's uncle. When he was a little boy, the church house, they didn't move him around a lot like we do. <laughs> anyway, so he wanted to tell something. He, he said, come over here. So I kept noticing, well, I have to walk over here again. And, well, we creep back over to the church house for something we were working on and come back over. He'd tell me the joke about 20 yards away. You know, I found out when they were little kids, they were taught, don't be talking those type of jokes around the church house. So here he is, a grown man, not knowing that his habit is still there. Walk over here and tell it. He didn't even realize it. And I thought that was nice to know that someone was so trained, so properly, and so respectful for those who trained him that he knew at least get 20 yards over there. Amen? How far would you have to walk away from the Lord's house for you to act the way you prefer to act? Well, apparently, as I was saying, they didn't have to go far at all. And then here, these two ladies were telling me, and I, why were they telling me? Somehow they sensed something about me that would not find that to be true of myself. Matter of fact, you can get up and jump over those pews, kick them around, throw them around, even threaten to make this thing a Jerry Springer show, and I would still be ready to go to my next point. What, Brother Carter? No, I can't get what's not there to get. I can't shake at what's not there to cause me to shake. You know why? And you all know why, too, because there's somebody else that can't take it. I told Howdy Doody here, and whoever you're thinking, you're actually right. I said, you need to understand something. What you're doing to me means nothing to me. I said, but there's people out there who can't take that. Your little boy antics. C.S. Lewis in his screw tape letters said, what we want if men become Christians at all is to keep them in the state of Christianity and, you know, Christianity and the crisis. Christianity and the new psychology. Christianity and the new order. Christianity and faith healing. Christianity and psychic research. Christianity and vegetarianism. Christianity and spelling reform. <laughs> if they must be Christians, let them at least be Christians with a different substitute for the faith itself, some fashion with a Christian coloring. Work on their horror. Watch this. Work on their horror of the same old thing. You remember when you'd be in church sometimes you say, this is the same old thing. You know what I said to a person who did that once to me? You know, saying somehow I'm the one that made it feel like the same old thing. I said, did you not hear the prayer request that morning? That lady just said that her daughter was terminal. Did you not hear that that morning? How could it be the same old thing if it's a new diagnosis for someone else? Well, what it was is they couldn't become the condition of those around them to empathize. And as an empath, that's just the way I'm created, recreated in Christ Jesus. Inner guiding disposition lead to help. Oh, no, wait a minute. So, really? Did you all hear all those things that were announced? You hear the young pastor we have? As he noticed when he heard that prayer request, he also wanted us to know that person was his age because that's what's going on in his heart. And he felt that deeply. Dear man, he's uh, called a Calvinist. Y'all have heard of that? Well, by the time he says what he's not, I don't know what he's talking about anymore. He said, no, it's not mechanistic. That's impersonal. It's not fate. It's not fatalism. That's impersonal. It's not deterministic. That's mechanical. And you're like, okay, so now we're back to the Bible. <laughs> now we're back to the Bible. Paul said in Acts 20, 21, testifying both to the... Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, repentance toward God, that is, he is still speaking of repentance toward God. What does it look like? It looks like faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of us. If you haven't trusted Jesus, don't say you've repented. If you've repented, mind it after God, who's the Father of Jesus. Now, just look, notice what I just did there. God's the Father of Jesus. That's personal. Do you hear that? So it's not about forensic and just the word, as we would say, scriptural, it's about a person. It's of this person, Jesus the Christ, His Father. 
I remember when I was a youngster, someone said, God is sovereign over all. I said, Amen. And they acted like it troubled them. I said, well, I thought you were talking about the Father of Jesus Christ. How could the Father of Jesus Christ being in charge of everything be a problem if He so loved that He would give us His Son? And how could Jesus Christ being the Lord of all the lords, King of all the kings, the one who reigns, the one who is the master of masters, the one who is the ruler who rules, the one who is a despot is despotic. How could that be a problem if He loved us so much that He died on the cross? Oh, well, if you bring that into the equation. No, there is no equation. That is the answer. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit in Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me. You all ever... Well, I know you did. You, you, I found out about Hudson Taylor from you all. Did you hear about those people that went out and started that faith mission, which means they just went to the field? Without even guaranteed support. Not even having established a certain amount. Just, just went. I think in history it says he spoke somewhere in the United States and I think like more than a dozen people were ready to go. Do you hear what I said? Ready to go to China. Paul said, I'm going. I don't know what shall fall me there. What falls us here? <laughs> I don't know anything yet. I, I, seriously, I, have, I am so as I should say, broken by what's happened to people, by the antics of loot and base people. Mm. He says, Save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, do you know what that phrase, the grace of the God is? That's a personification of Jesus. You say, wait a minute. One preacher said once, you need to personalize this message. Hold it. The Father of Jesus already did that. Grace is not a concept, not an abstract force. You know, we have the space force, but we don't really have the grace force in something that could be understood apart from Jesus, the grace from the God. Also, He's the personification of the glory of God. If someone has an opinion of God the Father apart from Jesus Christ, His Son, through whom, by whom, and in whom He disclosed His glory and conveyed the opinion to mankind that He accepts only of Himself, then you don't have the opinion that God the Father receives. Aren't you thankful that now we all have the same opinion about God the Father? about God because we call Him the Father of Jesus. About Jesus, we call Him the Son of God. Isn't it great when it's personalized already? Isn't it great that even in our beloved text, Ephesians 2 and 8, for you all are ones who having been saved once for all, by the grace through faith, are always being saved by the grace through faith. The grace is a personification of the Messiah of chapter 1. You say, Burkhardt, what are you telling me now? I didn't tell you anything. You hadn't already taught me. That's a personal statement. That's the person, Jesus the Christ. What else would the Savior do with us except save us? Do you know the Bible says that we were at our worst when He placed His particular love onto us? It says, while we were still devotees to sin, Romans 5, 8, still devotees to sin, He positioned, placed His particular love onto together with us. And that's because Jesus Christ died for us. You know, there would be no other basis for God, the Father of Jesus, to love us except that His Son died for us. <laughs> What would be the value of us apart from the investment made by Jesus the Christ, the Son of God? I've got to calm down here. I, I may start verse by verse again. What do you think? Yeah, I've asked people when they would try to give me their opinion of that stuff. I said, you know who you're talking to, right? They said, what do you mean? I said, you're, you're trying to tell me that your hardship in life is a pastor being methodical and systemic as he goes through the Bible. Well, you just don't understand. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it strange how people who are highly favored and blessed according to the world's standards have such low thresholds of that which can bother them? You remember we used, we were, there was something called weebles that wobble, but they never fall down? These people just wobble all the time. The Bible says that John the Baptist wasn't that kind of person that every breeze that would come would blow him like a reed in the wind. In Titus chapter 2, where we 
learned about older men teaching younger men, older women teaching younger women. That's where we learn all the wisdom we have today. All I am is someone that the salt shaker spilled out onto. And then we extend that to others and invest that. As it accrues, we continue. And it tells that these uh, young women might be taught to be sober, to love their husbands, love their children, be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Think clearly. A young man asked me when he was 20 years old, can I afford to buy a house at age 20? I said, well, do what a 50-year-old tells you to do. He said, what's that? What I'm saying. Why would young people say, if I'd only known then what I know now when we were standing there then? You want to testify? And why would they travel a road that we just said, that's not the right road? There they go. Like we were taught as children. Fools rush in, we're angels fear trip. But who could help us raise our children better than people that are under the authority of Christ and His headship? and receive His admonition as their service to Christ. What better could you do than model this behavior in actuality and live it out? It's really personal, isn't it? In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of a contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. If you ever ask your critics to tell you what's... Go ahead and define for me what's evil... I've shared it with a lot of people, but I, I would always keep a little card with me everywhere I've ever worked, never I've ever been. And you know, when things turn into a little Tasmanian devil dust cloud, I'd say, if you don't mind, I'd like to leave this card on my desk and I'll be right back. Uh, we don't wear watches anymore, but I'll get one for display. I'll be right back. Where are you going? I, Wait a minute, what are you? I said, well, I want you just to write down a couple of sentences what the problem is. I'm, I'll be right back, because you all know we were taught as children until you define the problem, you can't solve the problem, amen? come back, there's nobody in the office, there's just a blank card there. Now, I'd even share the story about an HR manager once brought me in because of some volatile grievance and I noticed that neither one of them had yet defined why I was here. Do you know it's a funny look on professional people's faces when one of the persons in the room stands up and exits the room they say, hey, well, where are you going? I said, well, until you all define why I'm here, I'll get back with you later. I bet you've caused a lot of problems. But oh, no, no, no. Just with evil people. No, just with people who are obsessed with evil antics and evil words. But we just can't seem to find it written anywhere. What, did, what was it now again? Well, if you can get it worked up enough, no one notices. See, that's why they take the money at the door before you go into the wrestling match. <laughs> they might throw a chair or something. Sound speech. Notice that. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, don't talk him back. We've all known about that, right? My kids tried to talk back to me while the lawnmower was running, but I can't hear you. Yard, mow the yard. Can't hear you. Not purloining, that means extorting, you know, taking more than what they were doing instead of rather giving a profit back. But showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Notice the grace of God. It's actually the grace, the salvific grace from God. That's the personification of Jesus. And grace has never failed. The salvific grace. Jesus has never strained to save somebody. Just never run behind people wringing his hands. Oh, I'm trying to seek and save the lost. Have you seen anybody I can find? And maybe if I find them, I can save them. Isn't that the saddest thing? And you know what it is? It's people who want to project outwardly the presumption that somehow, if enough people woo me, maybe. I was in one of those situations our dear pastor, Dr. Lynn Baxter, had warned me about. A revival was scheduled. It was during the start of a semester. New classes in some weird language like Hebrew and Greek, and I didn't know anything about that. But in that part of the area, we were take the advantage. We'd go out door to door to door everywhere, which... He noticed, you don't seem to have a problem with this. Oh, no, I'll stay out here all day if you want to. It's all I've ever done since I was 22 years old is just talk and think in another room. My last day to work was on a back dock somewhere, and I can tell you about it. I know the difference between work and talking and thinking. Well, boy, here it come. Well, we got to go see this fella. He's that hard nut to crack. 
harden up to crack. He was at the revival later that week. A dear pastor, very wise as well, told me once about a man who said in his hospital late in life, he said, don't want to hear anything about that. Don't want to hear about Jesus. Don't come up here talking to me. Well, he showed up to the room to see the older gentleman. He said, what are you doing here? He said, well, I'm not here to tell you to trust Jesus. I'm not here to say I even care if you do or don't. Well, what are you here for? I'm just here to say see you later. Bye. And he turned around and left. Later he got a phone call. That old hard nut made his reputation for being hard to crack. Found himself all alone about to enter eternity. All the silliness, which was nothing more than camouflage. You'll learn that in managing church conflict in the PhD program at Louisiana Baptist University. It's just, it's just camouflage. Just somehow to keep enough emotion going that no one notices that the problem here is a heart that has not experienced contrition. He has not seen himself in the presence of the holy righteous God who so loved that he gave his son so that he might always see himself in light of someone else onto whom he would not project any more than what he needed to to provide himself a, an assurance that, no, you're not impressing me. I wonder why people who are unwilling to be impressed with what Jesus did think that we should be impressed with them. But again, we're debtors to all men. So when I talked to that man, I found out his story, the one I worked with. And I gave him great disdain for what he had done to his family. He thought I was supposed to have some sympathy for him living out here by himself in some makeshift house. Now for a guy, I thought that's pretty good. I built forts and tried to stay out in the woods all night if it weren't for my parents. Matter of fact, last night, some of the young people over there, I know I went with one here all the way back to the deer stand a quarter mile back in the woods without a flashlight just to see if some kind of hoot owl would respond. So when he found out that I had no regard for him living like, he's just a man. Men live out in the woods. Got a pretty good shack. But you know what was missing? Responsibility for others. Someone that he had given up his life for. No, he kept saving his life. Kept saving his life. Shrinking back from anything that would, might fall on him. Well, here's what the grace of the God, the personification of the Jesus, the saving grace from the God is Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, if y'all remember bumper stickers, you say, Jesus saves. Y'all remember in computers or something new and odd, and they still are to me, but they say something about the computer and how he didn't lose his data because Jesus saves. I'll never forget that because it reminded me, I guess I better say that. But what does Jesus teach? What is this saving grace? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, that is our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, notice that. <laughs> He teaches us the saving grace of God, which delivers us from the antithesis of all these character traits He just described. If you're not zealous of good works, Jesus will save you from that. If you're not known to be a peculiar person, which speaks of one's own, that you are special as He is the only one who is the formative power in your life, that's what that testimony is, is He's the influencer in your life. You know when people notice that I'm not influenced by someone else, or I don't try to conform to their religion or their new construct, that by the time they finish explaining it, you don't even have one left. One person said of a construct, that's just fatalism. The man said, no, it's not. It's uh, this, this, this. I said, well, if you'd have said that in the first place. <laughs> we never said fatalism, amen? So who is this person who has the right to make out of us what we never would have made out of ourselves? The dear lady this morning that was a guest here came back and I was talking with the husband and the son and I said, Ma, you've done a great job with your family. She said, well, thank you. I said, well, it reminds me of art class in junior high. What? I said, well, we went in and the clay was already there in each of our desks. We didn't get to pick the clay. We just had to make out of it what we could. Get it? You know, my children, they'll never forget what their mama did for them. You know, she did things to them with them, by them, <laughs> and in spite of them. 
Do you know what some of the parents in this room know right now that we have done things for our children? Oh my goodness. Why? Why? And then people say, your children are quite peculiar. I said, amen. They are peculiar. They are very unique. My children say, yes, sir, and no, sir. And when I want them to respond, they respond. You say, what did it take? Something to break. It took someone bigger than me to save my children first from themselves. You know, if left to themselves, they'd have self-destructed. I even had to help them when they got married, tell them who to pick. And Brooke, I, I love you so much. But she had already wooed him before I got there. So I was doing a background check because I knew it was too late. He had already drowned in this brook and he's not coming back. Oh, and when I found out who she was, she's a Baptist. Oh my goodness, I was so happy that she believed in the gospel of the grace of the God. Because let me tell you something, as much as I know about her now, just a little bit, I guarantee you she's proof that it's got to be by grace. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, you say, well, Brooker, I, I, don't, I don't have your joy and exuberance when I talk about the grace of God. Well, then read the Bible and notice that God, the Father of Jesus, already personalized His grace. He didn't send us some abstract force. He didn't send us all that nonsense that we can speak of. He gave us Jesus. And I really loved all these testimonies today. I loved watching my grandson go over and toss a bag because he was in the midst of watching a video and troubled to have to go and toss that bag over there to his mom. But you know, if, he, if the Lord favors us to have him any length of time, he's going to get smacked a lot. You know, he's not going to say, wonder what that abstract force was that just smacked me. <laughs> no, he did something last week and it reminded me of the way some people are in relationship to God. I smacked him in the authorized spot. You know, he did, that didn't hurt. <laughs> so I love for him, I did it again. He waited a little longer. He said, that didn't hurt. I picked a different spot. It hurt. Do you know what God will do for you? He'll find your spot. And He'll make it hurt. And you'll wish to God you'd run to Him sooner <laughs> and you didn't need all those scars. I tell people, why are you ruining your life? Your mama's crying, your dad, oh my, these little church people be crying. Say, I don't know why those men do not care that they're wrecking your life and that they're making you cry. But you know, God's touched them now, hasn't He? You know, it says in the Bible, knowing the terror of the Lord will all appear before Him and give an account of what we did in our body, whether it be worthless or beneficial. You know what the argument is, the heads or tails? Is that individual? Is that all the saved people? Well, how about let's add something in the middle? Just, 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 to, just to consider the thought. What if that was to a church and that all of us are going to gather in front of Him as the church and stand before Him? Now, wouldn't that be something we should already be accustomed to? What will people do that were in the body of Christ, literally this church in the 70-year history we have, and they're standing there, and what they did in the church was worthless. But what will we do if what we've done was a benefit by the grace of God that contributed to His glory and the well-being of others? Won't that be glorious? We'll be rushing to that step. The beam of seed is a beam where the feet of Jesus are. We'll want to be there to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We won't go there waiting in some anticipation if the lotto number's the right match. We'll rush there, and others who wouldn't dare go there will be brought there. Won't it be glorious then? Let's pray. Father, we bow before you now. So grateful for this life. We thank you that you've given us your son Jesus. You defined love by telling us that we couldn't know love without your son laying down his life for us. So you loved us by showing us. You cared by sending him to seek us out and he was faithful to find us. And when he found us, he did what saving grace does. He saved us first and foremost from our wretched selves, from our dark-mindedness, our indifference, our alienation. 
convicts we were according to your Holy Spirit, enemies, and yet you reconciled us in your Son, Jesus Christ, not counting our trespasses and failures against us. Father, thank you that we need not compare ourselves with others, rather contrast ourselves with your Son, Jesus the Christ. And Father, in such a humiliation, we'll always be found very humble around those who would suppose that their sinful lifestyle might be something that should be an aghast to us. But Father, thank you for giving us hearts that empathize with people as they bring their lives to ruin for no reason. For no reason. And for these good families here, Father, that have given their lives and toiled and labored, knowing that there's no good thing in any of our flesh, but that all things we have come from you and that you favored us with the truth, you favored us with hearts of parents, hearts of brethren, hearts of sisters, hearts for this covenant. For that love that's abundant, we thank you for it. For those here today, Lord, that haven't been touched, or there's someone in their lives, they pray that you would touch them. Do whatever it takes so that they won't say any longer, that doesn't hurt, but give them a heart where they can feel an attitude of contrition, that they might present themselves as they should before you, the holy, righteous God, the Father of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand now for a moment of invitation.